incredible Dr. John Nowicki. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Dr. Heather. It's well, a, I appreciate it. Yes, well, Dr. John and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, Dr. John is a naturopath who actually uh, left brick and mortar to uh, pursue some research opportunities, and he's going to tell you more about that. But we are talking coronavirus today, and not just your typical conversation about it. We're going to get into some actual practical tools about what you can be doing and what you want to watch out for and some surprises in that. So do stay with us for the whole show and share this with friends and family because it's important that we inject some empowerment and positivity into the situation that's happening right now. So Dr. John, can you tell me a little bit about your background and what, sure. why, why am I going to ask you to come in and talk about this? Kind of right, right, right. Well, um, uh, again, thank you for having me. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, so I uh, went um, to naturopathic medical school, um, graduated in 2001. Um, had a private practice for uh, 15 years in Issaquah, small town outside. Well, not a small town, relatively decent size, almost city now, um, <laughs> about 20 miles east of Seattle. Um, and so I was in private practice um, doing general family um, medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and then in about 2016, um, I moved on from private practice to pursue writing and research. And so now my primary focus for the last four years has been doing writing and research um, from anywhere from journal articles to medical textbooks, um, some editing here and there as well, presentations mm -hmm. and whatnot. So I kind of, I, I function a lot of, as, a, as kind of a, a background ghost writer. So yeah. I'm always the guy in the back, um, which is kind of the way that I went to medical school too. Um, I was always just the guy in the back. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that discounts anything. I hope not. Um, <laughs> no. But, uh, but you know, I, I kind of have, have settled into that role, and I actually really enjoy it um, and have, have learned just as much doing writing and research um, yeah. as you did in clinical practice. I mean, there's certainly differences between the two, um, you know, looking at textbooks and what you learn in school and then yeah. seeing real-life examples can, can be completely different. Um, no, but you know to have love, both aspects of that has been really great. Yeah, you know what I love too is that you come from a naturopathic background, and so, um, but you also have very strong medical knowledge, academic, academic research knowledge, and and that's going to lend well to our conversation today. I want to make sure we just jump right in because this is going to be a, a really robust and good discussion. We did make a joke before we started that um, we are going to. Uh, there, there's an ante up for how many times we each put our face or hair or something along those lines. And so if you guys keep track, uh, then you can let us know who the winner is. And I'm not quite sure what the prize is yet, John. But we'll And I don't that. know if that's winning or losing. That's, <laughs> that's right. Good point. I don't know. I that's don't know which point. one it is. We'll see. So so we are going to, okay, unless you've been living under a rock, most of you have an idea of what coronavirus is. But very quickly, John, can you please just tell us what exactly is this as it relates to other viruses? Sure. So, um, you know, without getting too technical, coronaviruses is, is basically a, um, and it's hard to, to try to, so, so bring real in the plane sometimes if I'm way off track here. Yes. Um, but coronavirus is, is, uh, are ultimately this group of viruses that primarily initially affected animals. So they're mm -hmm. zoonotic viruses. Um, there are about seven of them that have transferred over and now affect humans. Um, the majority of them, probably four out of the seven, um, basically uh, um, present as the common cold. And so you would really never even know if you had coronavirus or a coronavirus. Um, so these aren't necessarily new things. Um, this particular strain of virus is new. So the ones that have gotten the, garnered the most attention, aside from coronavirus now or COVID-19 um, are, are uh, SARS and mm. MERS. And so, um, so you've got the severe acute respiratory syndrome um, and then MERS, which was Middle East um, oh. respiratory syndrome. And so the Middle East, um, I, I, gosh, I can't remember. I think it was a bat that went to a camel that went to a human. Okay. Um, the SARS was, they believe, is a bat. And so this, what this type, COVID-19 turns out, or what they're thinking right now, and this stuff changes 
every minute of yeah. every day right now. So this it's is pretty what we new. Know right now, what yeah. right now, what what they're thinking is that this particular strain of virus, so it's it's uh, SARS cov two, um, was most likely transferred from a bat. And okay. the first human that got it was in China, where they used to trade, or they still do, have live animal trade. And that's where they think it ultimately started from. Now, so, so it's a SARS type of virus, but it's just a slightly different strain. Okay. Um, symptoms can range anywhere from cold, like mild symptoms, to, in worst cases, um, pneumonia and, mm -hmm. and severe upper respiratory distress, acute respiratory distress symptoms uh, or syndrome, and then ultimately, um, in, in some cases, death. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not necessarily something to, um, to take lightly, mm -hmm. um, but for the majority of people, um, it's, it's a mild illness from what we see right now. Yeah. And I think it's important to say that uh, I think the current stats are around 80 percent are completely unscathed who do um, get the virus. They are either, like you said, symptomless or they have kind of coldy, fluy like symptoms sure. and a little bit different in each person. I think also I was just listening to another doctor talk on it and he did a great job talking about transmission and mm -hmm. how um, these droplets attach to lung tissue mm -hmm. and, and they multiply is that how you that's how the transmission works yeah and and again there there's there's um modifications to that that are still trying to be determined exactly exactly the the methods of transmission so okay. in almost all cases of um respiratory viruses if you will and certainly with coronaviruses respiratory droplets are are, are probably the main way that they spread um the difference is for some of these things is whether or not they can be transferred just through aerosol, you know, mm -hmm. like, Hey, you're too, you're close to me. And I decide to sneeze all over your face. Yeah. Um, there's a good chance that you're going to get whatever I have. Not always, yeah. but there's a, it's an increased chance. And um, we're gonna versus me. About, yeah. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. 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 So versus uh, if I happen to sneeze on a doorknob um, and then you come around later and touch it, are you going to get it? Mm. There's still some debate there. We don't we don't quite know. Um, the other thing about about uh, COVID nineteen is that um, initially it was thinking it was just respiratory. Now there's some thoughts that there actually may be some fecal oral transmission. Um, mm. It might not just be an aerosol. Um, so there could be some digestive stuff, perhaps even though that's not the way it presents symptomatically. Um, so there, all that kind of stuff is still new. We don't yeah. really know. There's not enough cases. There's really not necessarily enough cases. There's not enough research and evidence to figure out like, hey, how, how's everybody yeah. getting this? Even person yeah. to person, right? Because initially it was thought, okay, we're going to just, uh, at least in the US, um, monitor people who maybe had traveled to China or were mm -hmm. in contact with someone from China. And then it comes, you know, there was someone in San Francisco, I believe, who, who uh, uh, got the virus, but didn't have any of those types of epidemiological history. Yeah. And so, uh, so then, then that's where more and more research was coming out to figure out, okay, well, how is this got, how did this get transmitted? And yeah. so that, all that stuff is still pretty new. Yeah. Um, but, but from right now, yeah, coughing, sneezing, picking yeah. your nose and shoving it up somebody else's nose, not, not <laughs> advised. Not, not a good advised. choice. No. Yeah. And I think too, you know, um, watching, you know, Brent, my husband travels to China all the time and we actually were in the vicinity the week, the week kind of tail end of the week that it broke out um, and both got home safely with no issues. And it was, you know, all of that. Uh, and it's been a month and a half since, or two right. months since we were there, but just looking at how China handled things and the, the rapidity, is that a word? Rapid rapidity. I love making up words. Quickness. I have a ton in the no dictionary. <laughs> Um, that I come up with every with single day. They, they acted, um, they quarantined, and then mm -hmm. the, how that really helped does lend to kind of how the transmission is happening is, is sure. that it's close contact. So let's not hang out there too long because we have okay. so much going on. Yep. I know one thing that I really wanted to touch on that I think um, has not been done as well in the news. And that is, let's get some relativity here by looking at some of the historical viruses that we've seen in the past. Can you share a little bit about like 
we have numbers here. In fact, I've, I've got them. We've got, as of this morning, 125,000 cases, 118 countries, um, three, just over 3,000 deaths. Does, do these sound consistent for you? Yeah, they're, they're a little higher. Um, okay. Global cases are a little bit more. Deaths are 4,700. Okay. Um, in the U.S., as of this morning, if we just focus on the U.S., um, since, I mean, not that worldwide doesn't matter, because it it's, it's a pandemic. It's, yeah. it's spread all over the place. So, um, but in the U.S., there are 1,629 confirmed cases, 41 deaths. Okay. That's, um, the that's the right. majority of which have come from the nursing home in Seattle. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's where most of these things have happened, which is why we've sort of become the epicenter of coronavirus in the U.S. Yeah. But yeah, sure. you're right on track. I mean, it, again, it changes all the time. Right? right. And so these numbers are going to exp they're going to increase. There's there's well, no doubt about that. Yeah. And and um, OK, so let's talk about historical virus just for relativity. And then sure. let's talk about why people are freaking out. Yes. Yeah, let's just... I was going to say freaking the <laughs> out. But yeah, um, either way, not swear yeah. on camera today. But <laughs> not yet. Uh, not yet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> trying to set a good example. John. Should be the second challenge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that, and then let's talk about um, why the panic. Then, because obviously we know that there have been previous scourges. How do you say so, that? Scourge? Scourges? I don't know. Scourges. scourges? I, I, you're really doing a great job of making up words. I, I, I don't know what that word is. Maybe I'm just missing. I don't. Word. I don't know. Somebody, scourges. Somebody in the comments. Is that Canadian? No, somebody oh. in the comments needs oh, to I write don't have comments. Scourge, I don't S C O U R G E, and uh -huh. define it. Anyway, John, uh -huh. please go. Tell us a little oh. bit about historical so, virus. Um, and by the way, I can't see comments, so I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So no, if there's that, something that shows up. I got up, you. I got you for that. Awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, not to spend too much time on, on all the various different outbreaks yeah. that have occurred, but, you know, probably the, 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 the largest one that, you know, uh, that the world has really ever probably been exposed to is the uh, 1918 Spanish flu. Yeah. Um, that one was no joke. Um, I think the statistics were up to 500 million people were affected. Um, 50 million people died. Um, mm -hmm. 675,000 in the United States. And at one point, they, they had 25 million deaths in 25 weeks. Oh so basically, a million people died a week. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's some serious, that's a serious virus. Yeah. Um, now, thinking about the times, right? I mean, this is pre, uh, you know, pre internet, obviously, yeah. um, pre medicine. Yeah. Um, and in fact, they didn't even know what a virus was necessarily mm -hmm. then or what was causing this. Yeah. Um, so there really weren't treatments. There wasn't anything to do. Um, eventually, that virus kind of um, s settled in. It became more of an endemic, meaning that basically everybody was exposed to it. And so by that exposure, you had herd immunity. And, and sadly, either you died or yeah. you became immune to it. Yeah. And that's kind of, so that one's how that kind of settled in. Um, but those statistics are, are pretty incredible. And in fact, back then, the, the uh, population that was mostly affected were actually 20 to 40 year olds. Huh. Um, and so it wasn't really these extremes that we think of now. Again, life expectancy then wasn't necessarily as long as it is now. Um, but yeah. still to think of kind of your, you know, uh, healthy young adults, um, yeah. you know, between the ages of 20 and 40, they were the ones that were primarily affected. Um, so uh, then, then you've got, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about MERS because that was really pretty much Middle East. I think there were two cases in the United States that happened in 2014. Um, okay. It was pretty minimal. SARS was uh, um, another sort of outbreak um, that was from 2002 to 2004. Mm -hmm. um, that one had about 8,100 global cases in 29 countries. Um, the interest, it's not interesting, but it had a higher death rate. So it had 774 mm -hmm. deaths. So you had a death rate um, that was, that was a mortality rate of about 15%. Uh. Um, and so, um, and again, there was another respiratory um, illness. Um, most of the people in that case, um, you're, you get into that uh, same population that we think of now that are at higher risk. So greater than 60 in that, in that situation had yeah. almost a 55% mortality rate. So mm -hmm. age certainly made a difference. And we're starting to see that the same way with coronavirus in that the number of decades that you have lived, you're, the, the, the 
percentage of mortality, if you will, increases. Now, the last I saw, I think if in 80 year olds, it was 10%. So we're not talking about, you know, half the number of people, but we're also talking about a limited number of statistics. Yeah. Um, You know, and, 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 you know, it's hard to compare numbers because viruses are, they're just different, you know, they're going to affect everybody a little bit differently. So sure. When you look at numbers of seasonal flu, you know, and you're talking about a billion people around the world get the flu a year, a billion, yeah. not an M, that's a B, right? Yeah. And in the United States this year, 2019, 2020, 34 million people had the flu, okay? Yeah. Um, that we know of. These are just right. people that we know, right? Estimates. And it's not necessarily all the people that are tested, but estimates. Yeah. Um, you know, 350,000 hospitalizations, 20,000 deaths. I mean, that's significant. 20,000 um, deaths. I just 20,000 deaths just and, 2019, 2020 flu so far. Like just, just this just, winter season. Just compare that to how many deaths did we say so far from 41. F- 41 in the states, 20,000 yes. in the states of flu. Influenza. Yeah. Influenza. Yeah. Yeah. So different virus, different course. Yeah. Um certainly but the same um morbidity or same um um s- significance of the severity of if you know, if that virus turns into pneumonia, you know, in yeah. a certain population, then your, your, your risk of hospitalization and anything more severe is increased. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but, but the numbers, if you really do compare the numbers, um, it, it influenza is significantly more, uh, the, the numbers are way higher. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that COVID-19 is better or worse. We just don't, we don't have the numbers yet. We have no idea. Well, and I think, I think if all, if apples were to apples, we could say that, but the, it, I think the <clears throat> issue is speed of transmission is what the big alarm bell is with COVID. It's, that's the surprise sure. and that we don't know it's new. So it's, it's that, and that's the whole, the, that would be the, the kind of the end of the sentence right there. It's new. We just don't yeah. know. We have yeah. no idea. And we're not, te- we're only testing people that are, it, pretty much so far only at high risk. So your numbers are going to be skewed. You know, initially it was only testing people with certain clinical manifestations. So fever, respiratory symptoms, low white blood cell count. And um, I'm forgetting the third one right now off the top of my head. And also had a history of travel to China. But then they dropped the China part and then they had just the symptoms. Now they're starting to relax even those. So perhaps as we get more tests, we can test more people. And then you can get a really better idea of the rates as far as transmission, For sure. um, uh, pathogenesis, you know, yeah. pathogenicity, um, mortality, all those kinds of things that ultimately we'll see. But that, that's not going to happen for a for year a or two. I mean, so, at the least. So that, just quickly, we have two questions from Tao Wo. Uh, uh-huh. Number one is, what kind of investigation or test diagnosis corona? And, and my question is, on the tail end of that, why aren't there stands at Target that can like, pass? <laughs> Well, so um, good questions. Um, it's a nasopharyngeal swab. That's okay. the way you test it. So it's got to get way back in the back of your throat. It's not a fun test. Okay. Um, it's not just, you know, you can't just swab them. You got to stick this thing way in, get all the way down here and gather the sputum from back of the throat okay. um, without contaminating it with anything else that you have floating around your nasal passages. I see. Um, so... So it's not the, the easiest test per se, um, but it's not out of the ordinary as far as testing for viruses. Yeah. Um, why don't they have them at Target? Um, you know, it's interesting because certain countries are starting to have drive through, literally, uh, like drive through testing sites. Huh. Um, South Korea has probably been the best um, in, the, in the world as far as testing and their, their, the way that they've addressed coronavirus thus far. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, their numbers are incredible. They've tested 180,000 people. They have the capability right now of testing 10,000 people a day. Wow. Um, they've had 7,800, the last I saw, it might be a little bit higher now, but 7,800 confirmed cases and only 53 deaths. Wow. So their mortality rate is about 0.4%. Um, and they're still doing some of the same things. They're doing social distancing. They're doing the quarantine, but they're also testing a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and they're really getting a better idea of, of, of who might be carriers, um, how this is transmitted and those types of things. And then really isolating people who need the care that they absolutely yeah. deserve and need. Um, so, uh, so there's lots of different reasons why it's not happening here as far as drive through Some of it is just availability of the test. Some of it is the labs are, are 
might actually be overwhelmed yeah. um, by just, you know, there's test kits might be out there, but then there's other factors that are involved with it. So for example, in order to process a test, there's certain chemicals that have to be used. Yeah. And now they're finding there might be a backlog in the, in the, in the chemicals. Uh. So you might get tested, but you don't have the chemicals to process the test. Um, there's lots of uh, sensitivity and specificity issues. So false negatives, false positives, you sure. know, there, it's just not, and, and we don't know as much about it. So you're talking about putting people out there you know, in hazmat suits, basically yeah. trying to test. And then, and then what do you do with the patient who's sitting in the car? You yeah. know, the turnaround time is 24 hours right now. Um, hopefully that speeds up. I know there are a couple of countries that say they might be able to do it in eight hours. It'd be interesting wow. to see kind of like a rapid strep test. Yeah. Um, it's not there yet. So a lot of this stuff is investigational, but, okay. um, Look, but you know, th there's all those questions that like, well, what do you do with the person for the yeah. next 24 hours? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a great question. Do you send them home? Do you, yeah. you know, tell them to go about their daily routine? Do you tell them that you have to stay in your car for the next 24 hours until <laughs> we see? I don't know. Right. Nobody knows. Okay. Um, Let so, me ask the other question for, yeah. for this person. Um, and and <laughs> because, because I'm in charge, I'm going to tweak yeah. the question a little bit. Yeah. Um, he, uh, Tao says, how long does pandemic last? I, I, I'd like to know, can you just briefly say pandemic versus epidemic? And if there is any information on, can you, or is there a predictability to pandemics? Um, no, is the short answer. Um, as far as predictability. Yeah, there's, there's no way anyone could say, oh, this will be over in a year. This yeah. will be over in a month. This will be over in two years. No idea. That's why when you look at all of these other outbreaks, um, they have varying degrees of length. Some are two years, some are one year. So yeah. it depends on how fast the virus is transmitted, um, you know, and then ultimately what are the the measures that are taken to slow down the pandemic, which is where yeah. so social isolation comes in. And we could talk a little bit about that. Um but uh, an epidemic and a pandemic. So an epidemic is basically just a widespread occurrence of an infection. Um, okay. So in a certain community at a particular time, right? Uh, a pandemic is a bigger umbrella. So it's, it's an epidemic that's spread throughout multiple countries. Um, yeah. And they have different limitations as far as, oh, it's spread to three continents. So therefore it's this. And there's, it's about numbers more than it is anything else. And so, and, and so when you're talking about, okay, we've got this disease that initially was an epidemic in China, right? And now you can have small epidemics all over. Like we've got an epidemic in Seattle and we've got yeah. an epidemic in New York. Um, but as a globe, it's a pandemic because yeah. now we see, wow, it's 116 countries. And it's probably yeah. going to be more than that, you know? Yeah. So pandemic's just kind of an umbrella. And, and okay. really, it's just about numbers. At okay. some point, they just say, okay, this has moved from this level to here. Now it's a pandemic. Does yeah. that change anything? <sighs> Not a huge amount other than like, it sounds worse. Yeah. Um, but a pandemic doesn't necessarily mean like, awful mortality death right. it, it has nothing, nothing to do with that, to do with that. zero to do yeah. with like that's, severity that's of the illness important. Yeah. yeah zero to do with severity nothing let's, to do with it let's uh we're we're um we're, we're getting through some great content i want to make sure because the biggest reason you and i wanted to do this was to make sure that people understood that they have hope they can be empowered um there are lots of things we can be doing and um because most of the news that's been out there is wash your hands and sanitize and there's just so much more to it than that so sure. if it's okay we're going to switch gears into a little bit more about what do you do personally right. what you do with your for your family sure. um, and let's let's talk a little bit about that so uh, Dr. John, what are your initial recommendations for people who are, well, let's talk about the panic first. Sure. Um, you know, people are freaking out and, yeah. um, and to, to me right now, that is more scary by far than the virus is, is the degree to which the spiraling has happened. Sure. So can you speak a little to that and, um, your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, um, I mean, un uncertainty breeds fear, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's, that's um, it, it doesn't matter wh whatever it might be, right? In this case, it's a virus. But when, yeah. when, when we don't know what's going on or what to do, it generates yeah. anxiety and fear. Um, you know, I, I, not to speak too much about the way that this has all been handled. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think that we live in a different time where social media has, has exploded. Um, yeah. 
you know, some of this information and misinformation gets passed along really quickly um, and not just in our country, but around the world. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it's difficult to reel it all back in once it's out there to then say, you know, OK, you know what, we're way off here. Let's yeah. bring it back. But I think just that general um, um, uh, uncertainty, like I said, just that uncertainty, just yeah. not knowing. We just don't know. Yeah. And so that just that creates this level of fear, not only, you know, in, in, in any one individual, um, yeah. but just as a whole. Um, so, uh, so what I'm doing is hoarding toilet paper. Um, <laughs> I've got uh, a, a room full um, down the hall, um, and I have some in the shed. Um, and you're selling it for twenty five bucks. Not a roll. yet. Don't mess up my gig yet. Come on. It's supposed to be what we push at the end of the show. All right, not that's now. We got to build up to get the price point correct. That's your that's your gift to viewers is it's supply and demand. Supply and demand. Yeah. Um, okay. Can I no, just but, comment? Can yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I want to comment here because this is important. Um, you're talking about how we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. And that is very true. There's lots mm -hmm. that we don't know. And so we don't have control over that. True. But I want to remind everybody, four months ago before this even started, you didn't have a control over anything anyway. You didn't know if you're going to lose your job the next day or if suddenly your car is going to break down or someone's going to call and have cancer or what it is. We've always not had control. It's just flaunted in our face right now. And so um, that, that real surgence of panic, uh, I think it's important that we address that when our stress increases, when we panic, it is a grievous immunosuppressant it will make you far more susceptible to the virus than than so many things and so i think that's that's a key area to focus do, do you sure. agree with that yeah no absolutely i think that you know uh there there's a there's a healthy amount of stress that our body needs right? yeah so it's a balancing act so that you know it's, zero stress is bad for us yeah it's actually not good for you Right. Too much stress is also not good for us. There's yeah. kind of, there, there's this healthy balance between the two. And that's the case no matter, again, even with our immune system, right? Yeah. And that, that, this may be a side note, maybe we come back to it. That seems to be part of the issue that happens with COVID-19 is that in certain populations, the immune system goes crazy. And you get this thing called a cytokine storm. So you get all these chemicals that just start, it's your immune system doing what it thinks it's supposed to be doing, yeah. but it overwhelms the lungs and creates all this fluid that you just can't breathe out and causes sometimes even holes and fibrosis in the lung. I mean, it, it yeah. just causes a lot of damage. And so, so the, the idea is, you know, uh, finding that, that balance so that the immune system can do what it's supposed to do without it going too crazy. Yeah. Um, Stress and, and anxiety, certainly there's evidence that show that it, it significantly decreases immune function. Absolutely. Um, it, it lowers not only just the, the ability of the immune system to do what it's supposed to do. Um, there's also a kind of a delay associated with it as well that says, you know, you could be stressed right now and you're more, sus more susceptible, but that can last yeah. some time afterwards as well. So it's not just like, oh, I'm not stressed anymore. Yay, I'm good. Yeah. Your body actually still has kind of a bit of a delayed response. But, yeah. you know, th there is trying to, again, figure out that balance. And I think that that's a key word, you know, yeah. a balance between a healthy amount of concern um, sure. and not freaking out, panicking and buying all the toilet paper. Right. Now, again, a little side note with the toilet paper issue specifically, only because, you know, it's the butt of all jokes. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, that's terrible. Don't, don't, I hope I get zero I don't thumbs edit, up so for that. They're uh, going to hear that. It's awful. Um, but, uh, there, there's an interesting studies that have already been done, psychological studies that look like you were saying about control, um, and how that might be a way that people feel like they're more in control. Like, oh, I've got all my toilet paper I need for three months. Yeah. I've got ev all. I've got it all under control, right? For sure. So it's an interesting psychological aspect of why you know we go out and do some of these things, whether or not it truly is beneficial. Yeah. You know who knows? Um, do I think toilet paper is going to save everybody? No. Is it yeah. good to have on hand? You hate to run out of it. I mean, <laughs> just ask Elaine in Seinfeld. I mean, yeah. you know, when you're down to your last square, yeah, you got to got to be extra care. careful. So. Um, so, but fear for sure. I mean, you know, stress and fear and anxiety absolutely deplete the immune system. Um, and, and it's a difficult thing to manage because it's not, 
tangible, right? We can all feel it. We can feel stress and anxiety. We just don't, we can't measure it. Yeah. And so to try and figure out, you know, how the, how the body physiologically responds to emotional stimuli, if you will, yeah. um, is it's, it, I mean, there's a whole branch of medicine that studies that, but, it, so, and so we know that it does, but yeah, anyway. Let me um, just stop for a sec. Cause I want to, I want to keep this simple and part. practical and super yeah. direct. So, yeah. so I, I, first of all, I want to make sure that everybody is, is rem remembering to be, first of all, very gentle and kind with themselves over this because it is very, and I, I had clients this morning who are very, very anxious. And it's, it is so important that professionals like you and I are continually encouraging people to take a step back, take a breath, look at your own immune system, your own wellness first, then that of your family, and then that of your neighbors and friends. And, and that involves things like kindness and mm -hmm. uh, connecting as much. Mm -hmm. as, let's talk isolation because that's much different than staying home and people are confusing the two because sure. isolation is not a good thing in this situation. If, no, not unless absolutely warranted. Yes. Right. If you are 70 and you have lung cancer and uh, you are really susceptible. Absolutely. But sure removing yourself from human contact and panicking and um you know not having that essential human connection sure is, you can still do it safely i had dinner with friends last night and sure. um it's your choice but i'm just saying that i think it's really important that we don't lose sight of that isolation is not the answer community is still very important when done safely sure, sure. yeah i mean the the idea of social um isolation, if you will, um, or is, is really, it, it, it's the, from a public health standpoint, it's yeah. the best option we have right now. For sure. Right? And, and it has, that. and it has somewhat to do with the virus itself and spreading the virus. It has other things, implications as far as its effect on general health care, right? There's yeah. only so many beds that are around. There's only yeah. so many things that we can do. Um, and so the idea is to try and you know, uh, um, flatten the, the, you probably heard the term flatten the curve, right? Yeah. And so when you get this giant spike, you know, things can get overwhelming really fast. So if we temper that a little bit, it can slow things down. For that sure. doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to stay inside and not yes. do anything or talk to anybody. Because that, you know, if, if you've read anything about some of the people who were stuck on the princess, whatever it was, cruise ship, um, diamond, diamond princess, yeah. um, you know, they had significant psychological trauma associated with just being stuck there that, and many yeah. people felt like it was a prison. And, and yeah. again, we, we can get, you can kind of understand it from at that point, yeah. right. Where you're like, we don't know what's going on. Um, we've got these people that are sick. We got to keep everybody there until we figure this out now. Didn't happen. Um, yeah. but you know, people are having significant trauma associated with that. Um, yeah. and, and that, that's a possibility. Um, yeah. you know, think, so I it's, think... again, it's, to me, it's that balance. It's fine. It's figuring out, you know, how, how do I safely, um, uh, you know, or be mindful of the people around me yes. um, and public health in general, yes. um, but also taking care of myself and my family and doing things that, you know, just kind of allow me to function. It's not going to be normal. Yeah. But somewhat more in a normal fashion than just sitting as a recluse inside a room yes. waiting for this all to pass because it's not going to end and, anytime and that's, soon. It's just that's not. a big fact. I think we have to address, and that is this is guys going to, I mean, the, the anticipation this is a new normal for a while, and some of that is, is terrifying to some. But we can also look at it as an opportunity. And I want to stick here for just a minute. There is an opportunity in this. It, I think any sort of universal shakeup allows us as individuals to step back and take a look at so much about our life, about finances, our relationships. You know, I've talked to other chiropractors and if, if they're closed for two weeks, they go under. So sure. the question might be, okay, so how do I prepare myself differently going forward from a wellness standpoint? How do I mm -hmm. make myself more resistant if something sure. like this should come again? How do I make myself financially resistant? Sure. How do I make myself relationally ready? Mm -hmm. um, and so there are so many great opportunities in this. It's a horrible thing. Nobody wants this to happen, but um, taking taking the a moment to just go, okay, what what can I 
seize on this? How can sure. I make myself better? Sure. So, so far, I just want to recap. We've talked about um, I, I, that this is a stressful situation, but the more we focus on the anxiousness of it and the panic, the potential is that we suppress an immune system that is working very hard uh, to deal with the viruses that are out there. Sure. Number two is um, the, the social isolation thing that you can still go run in the forest. You can you know, give yourself lots of space between people. You don't need to lock yourself in a, in a house and not connect with people and not breathe fresh air. Agreed? Yes. Okay. Can you talk to me a little bit about supplementation and some other practical tools along sure. that line that people can feel empowered by doing? Sure. Uh, the, the basic health principles are probably first and foremost, right? Um, uh, eating well, you know, you kind of you avoid sugar. Mm -hmm. um, sugar suppresses the immune system significantly, probably even more than stress does mm -hmm. um but you add the two together which is what and they often go together yeah right? we stress eat right we're like i don't know what to do so i feed myself you know pasta and cookies and crackers and yeah. candy bars um and i feel worse than yeah. i was before but you know psychologically maybe i feel a little bit better until i have more potato chips later um uh, so so eating well sleep huge um, getting, getting rest again, difficult when we're stressed, sleep yeah. and stress don't necessarily go well together, but important to do, um, water. Um, and then you can get into kind of, you know, different substances, uh, natural supplements, if you will, that can just sort of boost the immune system. Um, vitamin C is a good one. Um, you know, how much, and, and how much should people be taking? It depends, you know, um, a thousand to 3000 milligrams isn't a bad place to be, um, you know, divide it up because you can, you know, the, the, you can have side effects from too much vitamin C, you get mm -hmm. di diarrhea. So you just want to, um, you know, spread that out through the day, but 1000 to 2000, it's not necessarily, it doesn't work as a antiviral. There's been some studies that just show that, you know, it, it may help like for cold, uh, cold and flu viruses. It may shorten the duration. Um, yeah. It may not be as severe. Okay. So it's not a cure. It's just, hey, it's, there's some immune benefit to vitamin C. Okay. Um, vitamin D, another, another significant one that we know impacts the immune cells and the, and the immune system. Um, and specifically in people in the Northern Hemisphere, for us out here in Seattle, where the yeah. sun shines about five days a year, um, we don't have any vitamin D. Right. Um, so taking some vitamin D, a, a good thing. How much, again, you know, 1,000 to 5,000, probably not a bad, just general range. Um, there's some evidence that higher doses can be helpful, but we have to be careful with fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin D and vitamin A that we don't get too much of them. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of different botanical medicines out there that are absolutely amazing for just uh, what we would call immune modulating, so balancing yeah. the immune system. Um, Echinacea is probably the one that most of us are familiar with. Um, that one, again, seems to have some evidence that shows, yeah, it, it could help with the duration of colds. It doesn't prevent them necessarily. Yeah. Um, it just kind of maybe changes them a little bit. Um, uh, certain herbs like um, um, neem, which is an herb that's often used in Ayurvedic medicine, has okay. tremendous benefit as immune modulatory and, and actually some antiviral characteristics. There are really lots of herbs that have antiviral characteristics themselves. Elderberry? Elderberry great example. Okay. Um, and actually one of probably the safest ones, um, as far as, you know, any age, uh, of, yeah. of taking it from kids to adults, um, and kids, you want to try and get one that's alcohol free, unless yeah. you really want them to sleep well that night, then you yeah. might want to get the alcohol ones. <laughs> um, but otherwise, you know, elderberry is fantastic. I mean, the, the, there are more and more evidence that comes out all the time about the potential antiviral effects of elderberry in and of itself. There's some fascinating evidence looking specifically at coronavirus um, or COVID-19 and how it gets into the body. And so I was looking at this yesterday. Um, and there's these receptors called ACE receptors, which are angiotensin converting enzymes. Most of us think about those with blood pressure because okay. they're, they're in, they interact with angiotensin and renin system, which controls our blood pressure. Well, it turns out what this virus does is it attaches to those receptors to get into the cell. 
So that's how it works, or at least what they think so far. So it's kind of like, you know, that that's how it enters in, and then it changes the DNA of the cell itself so that the virus can replicate. They're they're brilliant organisms, by the way. They're super smart. Um, but uh, um, I was doing a little bit of research and found actually there's some natural products that that actually may inhibit the virus from entering the cell. Now this is not done on COVID-19. This is just my extrapolation of some evidence. Yeah. But there are a couple of flavonoids like hesperidin um, and, uh, and a vitamin nicotinamide um, that may have the potential of helping um, decrease the, the effects of viruses. I see. Um, it's, th this was a study done in China. The, China actually has some fascinating research on traditional Chinese medicine and herbs that have been used actually for COVID-19. Um, and in a lot of their protocols, they're included in there. Um, ah. Because right now we don't have conventional antiviral medications. There's some, uh, um, they're trying to repurpose a couple to see if it works. Chloroquine is probably the number one on the list right now that seems to have more of an effect, but it's primarily in vitro. And yeah. obviously there's no vaccine. And who knows, you know, at this point, whether or not there will, there will be one. It's at least a year out though. So that's just, so, so there are some natural things that we can do that may help. It doesn't mean it's going to prevent it, yeah. but it may give you just that little bit added boost to, uh, you know, if nothing else, it's not going to hurt. Yeah. Right? Taking sure. some extra vitamin C doesn't hurt. Taking some yeah. extra vitamin D doesn't hurt. Taking elderberry doesn't hurt. Yeah. And so, you know, I'd rather do that um, and, and, uh, and, and potentially get some benefit yeah. than, sit around and wait for, for sure you know, to see what happens. Well, and anything, that's just me. anything that you electively do that, that in your mind is going to protect you and help you and boost your immune system has a biochemical effect, whether, sure. you know, and so I think that's really key as well. So that leads into something because uh, a, there is, there is no medical answer, which whatever, and uh, vaccine, we don't even need to go there because that's gonna be a whole other conversation next year. Good luck with that, by the <laughs> way. Uh, and then, um, you know, supplementation, there's lots of opportunity there, but people uh, ensuring you are getting a super whole food, vibrant, multicolored diet is absolutely necessary. And so when you're going to the store to pick up all of your toilet paper, Stop in the vegetables and fruits and load up. Because it's amazing the perishable goods that are still remaining on the shelves yes. and what's missing from the shelves. I know. And that's uh, a bad sign to me because it, this yeah. is the time more than any that you are fueling with nutrient dense opportunities to fight virus and protect yourself. Sure. And, um, and so that's really, really essential as well. Uh, there's a great quote uh, I just want to insert right now by Dr. Sharkaway uh, that was running all over Facebook yesterday. It was a long thing. Dr. Sharkaway is a um, infectious diseases specialist doctor. And uh, one of the quotes was, I implore you all temper fear with reason panic with patients, uncertainty with education. Mm -hmm. And I, I loved that um, because we can't come on here and go, guys, don't worry. It's right. fine. You don't, it's right. all great. It's it. There's, there are issues, but sure. for several reasons, uh, the media, one of the biggest ones, things are very explosive online and very um, charged and full of emotion, sure. and uh, and so we need to be careful about that. So Absolutely. I just want to I just want to recap because it is important. People kind of come and go in the show. Uh, just want to talk again. We talked about stress, you know, balancing, and I love what you said about stress. There's great TED talk on stress about how stress is good for the body. It's our mm -hmm. reaction to it that is sure. the problem. So sure. it's how you how you physically and emotionally respond to the stressor um, does it rise you up and make you feel mm -hmm. like and you know conquer this or does it deplete you and knock you down um, those are the things that, that how it affects you positively or negatively um, and then we talked about some supplementation you said vitamin D you said 1,000 to 3,000 or 1,000 1,000 to 5,000 yeah but, and you know, I, I personally I, would just, I recommend higher than that but I do I do also I just you know I'm I'm tempering that for the, um, uh, the, the way that this discussion may reach yeah. wherever it for reaches. Sure. Um, 
I certainly do different things. So, yeah. and some, some of it's different between therapeutic dosages and what you may want to do preventatively. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I've sense. seen, I've seen some studies actually where they've used IV vitamin C in China for COVID and they're, you're yeah. talking about 25 to 30 grams. Now you can't no. take that orally. No. Um, so, I mean, you could, you're just not going to leave the bathroom. That's when you need the <laughs> toilet paper. So, you know, right. there, we may come full circle here. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but no, I think, you know, certainly these dosage, these ranges are, are, they vary and, and they're, and they change even between people. And so, sure. you know, I don't like to get stuck in kind of no. a, like, oh, it's this much, um, I, because it really depends, but there's so vitamin D 1000 to 5,000 vitamin sure. C 1000 to 3000, um, elderberry, a teaspoon to a tablespoon. It depends. Excellent. Okay. And yeah. then echinacea. Again, depends on the potency, uh, okay. depends if it's a tincture, if it's pills, you know, okay. the only thing that you want to be careful of with echinacea is that uh, the immune system tends to get used to it. And so you okay. lose the benefits of it. So you want to, if you're going to take it, you want to take it for like, you know, five days on, two days off. So maybe during the weekdays and take off on the weekends, Good. or if you're more disciplined, two weeks on, one week off, you know, yeah. um, I'm not that disciplined. So I got to be like, okay, yeah. it's Saturday. I don't do things on Saturday. Um, yeah. Monday, I'm back on it, you know, but if you That's tell me good. two weeks in one week, I, I I'm lost. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of the same. I'm I don't know what same. I did last Tuesday. I have no idea. Did I take my echinacea? I, yeah. I think so. It was Tuesday. I think you so. Know? So that's how I want to continue our recap. So also just making sure that the isolation piece is concerning to me because we have that. It's already a problem <laughs> in our in our nation of people isolating and not having contact with people. And if we draw in even more, we need to do that. If you are in the on the immunocompromised list, you're elderly. Absolutely. You need to take those recommendations very seriously. And you do anyway. But it doesn't mean you can't go for a walk in the forest or get some fresh air or meet a friend for a walk. Um, it, it doesn't mean that you still want to have social distancing, but clamoring yourself up in a closed house isn't going to solve the problem either. Just make sure you're respecting that and, and knowing that your body needs fresh air and open your doors and FaceTime a friend or, you know, at least stay connected somehow with your community. That is absolutely essential. And just as a side note there, yeah. Dr. Heather, before like, uh, there, there has been interesting research on just with buildings in general and how important ventilation um, and humidification is. And so it just made me think about that with going outside, yeah. because if you do trap yourself in a build, that's, that's kind of, these viruses like those kind of things, you know? Yeah. And they also like cold weather. And so one of the things with COVID-19 is it doesn't like ultraviolet rays and it doesn't like heat. Um, and so, you know, the nice thing, I guess, if there's a good thing about some of this is we're approaching hopefully some of that warmer climate, right? Yeah. So, um, so, so as we move into summertime, this may die off a little bit faster than it had yeah. this started in September. Yeah. Um, but just thinking about that going outside, it's not bad to go outside. It's actually good. That's a good yeah. thing. Um, and yeah. getting some yeah. ventilation, getting the humidity that our body needs actually it serves so many different purposes aside from it just helping in this particular case. It's, it's a good thing to go outside. And these are, again, talking about, hey, this is, this is one of those, you know, um, we only get a few of these in a lifetime, usually where you have just a universal shakeup. Look at it as an opportunity to reflect on what's happening in your life, personally, finances, friendships, relationships, all of those things. What do you want to do differently? I love the analogy of juggling a bunch of tennis balls because that's probably how we all were coming out of Christmas. And now all of us have had to just drop every single ball. And now you get to choose which ones to pick up and to continue. Sure. You know? uh, and so look at that as an opportunity. We don't often get that. I just had a family in this morning and of course their kids are out of school. He's working from home. Um, she's on maternity leave. And they're like, this is, you know, we, we happen to have the benefit and, and blessing of being healthy, we are going on a family thing that we would never get the opportunity to do. They're just going to go sure. live somewhere else for a month. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, there are opportunities in this. It's not all complete doom and gloom. And we have to look at for those lights and, um, and places that we can focus and feel a little bit of joy and, and, um, and happiness in, in that. So, sure. um, Anything else that we've missed from practical application? Um, I don't think, again, you know, it, it's, it's changing all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I think going back to the basic tenets of health, um, making sure that we're not going to extremes, um, you know, all the things that you said, you know, and, and I really like that idea of, you know, 
we don't get opportunities where everything is stopped and, and our whole yeah. lives are completely, you know, disheveled where you're yeah. just like, I, I don't know what's going on. Um, it's an interesting time for some introspection and just evaluation to see, yeah. you know, where, where we're at and what, you know, what, not just what's important, but like, you know, yeah. it's a good evaluation time. It's a, it's not a bad time to pause. And so rather than looking at it as, oh my gosh, uh, my life is over. I can't do anything. Yes. It's, it, you know, I feel like a lot of our, and, and I'm stereotyping Americans in general, but we're always go, 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 go. Yeah. And, you know, and, and part of the, that when we get sick, that's our body way of telling us to stop. Yeah. We're going too much. This yeah. is an opportunity where hopefully the majority of us don't get sick, yes. but we're given that opportunity to really just slow down for a second yeah. and look at, or look around and just figure out what's important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, like you said, you know, kind of rather than having, you know, 23 balls that you're juggling, that'd be amazing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, try two. Yeah. or three or four, you know, like it just and pick up the ones you want as opposed to trying to do all these other things. So I think it's a, it's a very unique opportunity. I it's not the way that we, I, we ever hope that these opportunities no. arise. Um, but when they do try to make them positive as opposed to looking at them as doom and gloom and negative. Yeah. And, and a couple final thoughts. Uh, one is that um, there is, there is opportunity here um we've seen in the news and, and different things where uh, people are agitated, they're irritated with each other. There's an opportunity to be unkind and rude to each other. Please, please, please raise that kindness bar and be as loving toward each other as possible. Reach out to those that you know are isolated. Uh, make sure they get a phone call or a FaceTime. I know I'm talking to girlfriends um, this morning whose parents are, they're concerned for their parents. And so- sure. We want to make sure that we're we're connecting with those people regularly. And I love the term immunocompetency. And that is such a this is one of the biggest reflection points we can take this time is our, you know, sanitize your hands, yes, sanitize stuff, yes. But if you are a, a not immunocompetent competent, that's different than compromised, competent, where you are at your best self possible, this is an opportunity to say, what do I need to be doing differently? Sure. How yeah. can I go forward and go, oh, I see the value now because trust Dr. John and myself, this will not be the last time in our lifetime, if you're our age or anywhere near our age, that we are going to be dealing with something like this. I think it's, it's, I think it's probably, what do you think, John? I mean, it's, it's certainly possible, you know, the way viruses change all the time. I think that's, the, 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 and not to make this all concerning, but I think that in the long term, you know, what we're always trying to be weary of and cautious of is when these viruses do what they do. And so, you know, the benefit in, in comparing some of these viruses is to look at the pathogenicity versus the transmission rates. And, and you know, we just got, that's what we want to put the pieces together to say, you know, like what we don't want is something as pathogenic as MERS, as yeah. transmissible as the flu. Yes. That's when we, so, so like, so we're putting all these pieces of the puzzle together. Um, is it possible? Absolutely. Um, I hope not. I mean, oh, we all really? hope not, um, but that's what viruses do. I mean, yeah. that, that, like that, that's, that's how they survive. It's how they live. Um, and so it's very, very possible. And so taking care of ourselves the best way yeah. that we can and um, I, in, I in the meantime that, is, yeah. is, a, is a great thing to do. And I think, uh, you know, we can look at this very sort of esoterically and, and say, you know, this was this can be a dress rehearsal because there's an 80 percent recovery rate and all of that. This is a chance to go, oh, this is what it would look like, sure. you know, schools and businesses and, this, you know, all sorts of things. Um, if this were to happen on an even bigger scale. So what do I need to do personally and for my community to make sure that we are really well prepared next time to handle it? You know, sure. better. And and just to go back to a little bit with the hand wash hand washing is that stuff's still important. You yeah. know, like oh, we don't the, yes. the, so like I don't want to discount any of that, no. you know, with the you know, you don't need hand sanitizer. Soap and water works actually Soap perfectly and well. Water. And so, you know, if you're if your store's out of hand sanitizer, it's okay. 
Um, it doesn't mean, you know, you have to go buy vodka and pour it on your hands. That would be a terrible waste of vodka. Um, <laughs> but also like soap and water breaks down the viral capsule. It works. And yeah. so, you know, so, so don't forget some of those just basic hygienic oh, principles sure. that we all should have been following for a long time. It's just, a, this is another reminder yeah. of some of those ways and things that we can do, not just to help ourselves, but to help each other. Yeah. Um, in, in making sure that some of these things as much as we can to reduce our risk over time. And so, you know, all of the things that you shared, I think, that in, and individually, we can also continue to do some of these yeah. things that no, think- we've now been kind of awakened to, to say, hey, don't forget to wash your hands. That shouldn't even have been an issue, but yeah. it was, and it is. And now it's yeah. like, oh my gosh, we're going to wash our hands. You know, great. You should have been doing that already. Yeah. But, you know, it's just another reminder. It's a good thing to do. It is. I think it's a great. And, and again, as we've already talked about, um, this is a hard this is a hard time for many people. And if we can just find small opportunities, you know, mm-hmm. in these situations, um, then that helps us get through it, too. Sure. So I think Absolutely. That, that's super key. Uh, I know there was one more thing. Oh, I just want to mention before we close out and I'm going to ask John just at the very end for any last minute words. But I want to remind you guys that this is extraordinarily hard on your local small businesses, your artists, your uh, folks who just barely scrape and buy month to month with their bottom lines. So instead of heading to Walmart and Costco, no diss in you guys, but I know you guys will make it through, you know, go get bread from your local bakery or order it, order meals. I know lots of small catering companies are now delivering meals. So that's an opportunity. Look for those opportunities to support your community and um, the people in it who are going to have really long-term repercussions from this whole thing. Um, And another good idea somebody said was buying gift cards from your, if you would normally go to the restaurant, get online and buy a gift card for, you know, spend the money, um, use it later. uh, But just, allow them to get their monthly bills paid and all of that. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, John, any any last minute comments or practical tips for Um, viewers? I mean, we we touched on most everything. I think, again, you know, just to go back and just to reemphasize, this could be a different talk that we have next week. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's changing so rapidly. Yeah. Um, I, I think that overall, if I were to take a big picture of what we're looking at right now, I think that, you know, the numbers and the statistics that are thrown out there, we have to really dial back because we don't have a good idea of what all this stuff means. Yeah. We don't have the testing capabilities. We don't even know if people who are necessarily asymptomatic are transmiss or are, are, are spreading the virus. We don't, we don't right. know. And that could change these numbers dramatically. That 80% could be 95%. Yeah. You know, because they're, they're, you and I could be walking around right now with it and we would have yeah. no idea because we just yeah. don't have symptoms. Yeah. So, you know, so I just think when we're, when we're looking at uh, this, this is a big picture and we're looking at numbers, um, you know, because that's what I think everyone focuses on. Look at the mortality rate. Look at this transmission rate. Look at the, we're talking about a very, very tiny number, um, you know, because because yeah. when you put it in the big picture, like influenza, yeah. which has a mortality rate of 0.1 percent, but you have 34 million people affected and 20,000 deaths. Those are dramatically higher numbers, but percentage wise, they're they're different. Now, this one may be a little bit more. It's probably closer to one percent, yeah. um, but it's probably not going to be three percent. And it exactly. certainly probably isn't going to be 10. And so, yeah. you know, so I just think that, that being mindful of that, um, you know, taking the necessary precautions that we need to take, but not going to extreme measures. Um, and just, uh, again, reemphasizing just those basic foundations of health, you know, diet, sleep, water, um, community, yeah. uh, friendship, Nature, all love, of those things are so here. important. Yeah. And, and not to l- let those get lost in the shuffle while we're, we're distracted by all these gigantic numbers and, and exactly. divisiveness. It's just yeah. it's unnecessary. And, and just always, you know, know that uh, with, with all of the media coverage and there's so much of it now, I mean, you're getting messaging, 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 take a neg elimination break. Just, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with checking the news first thing in the morning, checking it again later in the day once, but don't be checking it every hour. Just give your brain a little break from all of that information. If something big happens, you will know. Uh, Stay informed, um, but don't dunk in it. You know, Um, I think that's important too. Uh, Hold on, John. Yeah. Um, My... (laughs) I thought my 
computer was plugged in, but the light switch wasn't on. Oh. Yet, so I was just about to lose you. So I'm glad that we can <laughs> finish up properly without me going, okay, bye. <laughs> you, you wouldn't be the first person to do that to me. I, <laughs> I can handle it. I can well, take John, it. thank you so much for coming on. We uh, made it almost a full hour, my friend. Wow, awesome. uh, which is great. And yeah. uh, now, everybody who's watching this live, we will go. Any questions we didn't answer, uh, John and I will go into the comments and answer. Uh, anybody who's watching in replay, you will get your questions answered too. So please note in the comments if you have any additional comments, thoughts, questions, anything. We will be circulating, you know, for a week, coming back and looking at these comments. Also, this show will live forever on the WellFit and Fed YouTube channel. So if you missed it, you can know you can always go over there and check that out um, and make sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any future shows. So thank you, Dr. John. Stay, thank you. On, stay on so I can uh, give you a few post show notes and everybody we'll else. Thank you for watching. Love having you here and stay healthy, wash your hands, you know, but also make sure you're taking care of all the other things too, that we talked about today and uh, give your kids and partners lots of hugs and we will see you guys soon. And one last, one last yeah. one of these, one oh. last one of these. One, one last touch. One I last think one. I won. I think I won. I think you did too. All right. Everybody. All right. Bye. Well, thank you.